Okay. So, uh, Robin, out of 1.4 billion Indians, every small kid in India aspired to become a cricketer and only a handful get to make it to top 11. What was so different in you and what was your mindset? What was, was it like luck? Was it uh, hard work? Was it uh, more some X factor or you had just a very different mindset? So what was the, the gift of hindsight to be able to go back and think about everything that I did right? Uh, and uh, I think as a kid, for me, my passion, uh, my first memory of myself is of me playing cricket. Really? My first conscious memory of myself is of me playing So you started the playing at what age? I must. My mom, like inside the house, you know, it play inside the house, she'd chuck the ball, it hit the ball. I remember the first, I think, conscious memory I had of myself is of me holding a, a plastic bat, my mom rolling the ball and me hitting it. Um, so for me, I knew I always had some, something to do with cricket. You know, cricket's going to be a big part of my life. So I would always look to go and play with friends around the uh, colony, um, you know, wherever they played. I just go and pop in there. Even though it was much smaller than all of them, just kind of hover around them just to get maybe six balls to play. Um, and then my parents wanted me to play uh, tennis. They wanted me to play an individual sport. My mom and dad both come from my mom does a little bit of sporting background, but my, my dad was a former international hockey umpire. Oh, means, so I really played hockey at the national level. Uh, then gave up uh, playing and then became, uh, I think, one of India's first few international hockey referees. Really? This was in which year? Um, way back in the 90s, yeah. Um, so your dad was then? My dad was a red umpire. Like, he was an umpire. Okay. Uh, in hockey. So he was, I think, Karnataka's from where I'm from, Karnataka's second international referee and the first from his player, his district. So, so he ran away from home at the age of 15 just so that he could play hockey. He didn't want to join the army. His elder brother joined the army. So he wanted to play hockey. He was really passionate about hockey. So played hockey and then eventually he went through a few things. Um, and then as goes, he, he wanted to like, stay with the game but do something connected with the game. So he did umpiring. Then he became a national umpire and then became... Uh, the first international hockey umpire from Pur, that's where he's from. Okay. Um, so he saw the downsides of playing a team sport mm. and he saw the politics that were within it and all. So he wanted me to play an individual sport. So the first sport they made me play was tennis and I love tennis. Uh, it's actually my favorite sport. Um, maybe even slightly ahead of cricket, honestly, uh, today. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed it. I played it for about a year, a little less than a year. Uh, when I was six, six and a half, seven years old. And then I think at the age of seven, I opened a newspaper, you know, <laughs> which my mom uh, was actually quite surprised by. I opened a newspaper and I, I just didn't go out to play that day with my friends in, in, in the apartment. And then I opened the newspaper, I went to mom and I said, I want to go to this summer camp. Okay. Yeah. And and that was uh, the British Patil in Tiaz Cricket Academy in Bangalore. It was a very famous academy in Bangalore. So... Uh, uh, my mom, just the fact that she saw me open a newspaper and, you know, uh, I put out, uh, and I told her I want to go there. It made, me, made her feel like, okay, this guy really wants to play cricket. And uh, fortunately for me, I think they discussed it. And the next day, I saw the first pair of uh, batting gloves I ever saw in my life. My dad brought one for, for me. I didn't know it was for me or for someone else. But I was super excited. And, uh, you know, sure enough, they, they put me in the summer, uh, the summer camp. And uh, that's how it began for me. Um, I just find this whole thing of um, bringing 15 minds together, 20 minds together to achieve one goal, highly exciting, you know. Uh, so for me, I feel when I look back at my career, I feel like um, the passion was always there. I always knew cricket is what I wanted to do. Um, and I want to pursue it. I remember the, you know, I went for my first state selection at the age of eight uh, for the under 13 state selections. I was fairly good. Uh, and I got cut in the first round and you know obviously you know mum and dad were like you know don't worry it's okay and I remember telling my mum and I said I'm not worried mum I'm actually quite happy I'm, I'm very happy I know that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life and I said to her this must be in the 1996 perhaps I told her 96 no 94 95 mean. I said to her even if I earn 20 rupees from doing this this is what I want to do for life uh, my mom again was like, what is this <laughs> wrong with this kid? The mindset is, yeah, the mindset was like set for me. Yeah. And uh, I think I just kind of believed that I would play for India. Uh, I would spend hours on end um, as a kid 
between the ages of 10 and 14, playing what we call the hanging ball. So you put a ball into a saw, tie it on a rope, put, hang it on a, hang it on, um, tie it up to something on the scene, and then you knock. So you knock. So I would visualize batting along with Sachin Tendulkar, building partnerships with him, with Rahul Dravid, BBS Lakshman, Saurav Ganguly, Yuvraj Singh. And I, that would be my go-to pastime every time I had holidays or every time I had nothing to do or friends weren't there. I just spent hours on end doing that. Uh, and in, in doing so, I felt like I visualized and kind of manifested it into my life. And I just believed that I'd play for India. I don't know how, I don't know what, I don't know when. I didn't worry about the how, when, where, what. I just knew that I would play for India. So there are very interesting things you have just described. You know, one which is as this podcast against all odds and you require a belief to require a visualization and require to manifest. So when did you ever think that what if you will not achieve and what if you don't get there? I didn't think that far. I just like, you know, as a kid, I think that's, that's the beauty of being a kid. You don't kind of overthink things. You just believe and you live in that little bit of a dream world, which we, I think, as we become adults and we grow into our own responsibilities and get into life, we stop living in that little bubble that we create for ourselves as kids. And I think I see that today with my with my son. He just lives in his own world, you know, in there, that, in that little world. In that little world, everything for him is possible, right? Uh, and I think uh, we lose that along the way. The um, you know, with with the innocence of youth, I think that that thing is so well kept. And we also had lesser distractions. Yeah. You know? Today, there's so many more distractions. I think kids become adults very, very quickly today yes. compared to how, how we were when we were kids, right? Um, so for me, I felt like I just believed things would happen. And I've never considered, what if it doesn't happen? I always like, I'm batting with Sasha. I'm enjoying that steel. I'm batting with Paji. I'm batting with Lakshman. I'm batting with sort of Ganguly. I'm batting with Rahul Dravid. And incidentally, my first game for India, I had a 168-run partnership with Rahul Dravid opening the batting with And... You got selected for Indian cricket team in which year? I was uh, 20 years old, uh, 2006. I made my debut. Yeah, and that was your first match. That was my first game. Yeah, for India. Yeah, no. I, I made it early because I was considered a little bit of a prodigy growing up. I made it very quickly to the first class side. I was in the. I was 16 years old when I first played first class cricket. Mm. Um, I, you know, played. I, I kind of played everything that very young. So a lot of the parents, when you know, when I was growing up, thought I was I was overage. Really? Yeah, yeah. Because I was I was also a big kid. Nah, uh, because growing up, I had. So you were like overweight at that time. I wasn't overweight till the age of twelve. Till the age of twelve, and then I had I was diagnosed with epilepsy. Okay. Um, and then between twelve and fourteen, fifteen, I had to take steroids for three and a half years. And uh, you know, I remember one of my closest friends I grew up with. Um, you know, he. He, uh, I didn't go to the, I didn't go to the summer camps or academies for about six months, and then he saw me after six months. Like, what happened to you, man? As like, I couldn't recognize you because I just kind of doubled in size and everything kind of slowed uh -huh. down. I just put on weight very easily, and uh, it's something kind of I've kind of struggled with since that part. Till then, I felt I even feel like it stunted my growth. I feel like for the the length of my limbs, mm -hmm. uh, I'm supposed to be taller, but I'm not as tall as I, as I should, as I should have been. Is what I feel. Okay. Um, and the reason was because at that age, you know, between left, like 12 and 15, I'd taken steroids, you know, and I felt like it just messed something up within within my system. And I feel like I'm always playing catch up with it um, ever since, you know. And um, I was a big kid, I was a big burly kid, I was stocky. Um, and people always, and I, my, my style of play was very aggressive. So people always considered me. Oh, you know, he's being so aggressive because he's overage. Okay. You know, and with all the bone testing in the world, nothing is said that I was overage in any way. It's proven otherwise. But, uh, you know, you know how parents are when, you know, playing with their kids and, you know, I think it's a protective nature. And you've yeah. okay, yeah. And in cricket, in different parts of India, there's this certain amount of fudging that goes up. Yeah. Um, which is a lot more streamlined. Our systems become really rigorous with that, um, which is good. But it's it, it used to be a big part of our system growing up. Exactly. And so when you like in your teenage mm. and when you're preparing to, you know, um, for your matches, what was your schedule like in that time? How many hours you used to practice and play? What, what was that exactly? What was your what were your days like in those days? Um, school obviously took a backseat because I was a very good student till the sixth and seventh that 
Mm. After that, cricket became like a big part of my life. So for me, I started playing. Um, I started playing for state, mm. uh, the under thirteen states. I when I was nine. Okay. Because the year I got dropped, mm. the year I got cut at the age of eight. The next year I played for 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 my state at the age of nine, and then I played continuously for the state till the age of sixteen until the till I played first class cricket uh, at the age of sixteen. So and I was always very young. So at nine I played under thirteen. At ten I played under fourteen. At eleven I played under fourteen. At by twelve I was playing under sixteen. So I was always a little ahead of the curve. Um, and for me it was just my routines were very clear. And I practiced six days in a week. I practiced morning and evening. Um, there was no concept of training at that point in time. Okay, in cricket, nothing. No, left just have practice, just practice and run in field. You know all of that. You know. No strength training, um, nothing, uh, nothing, no concept of a gymnasium at all. Okay. Nothing. That came out only in 2001, 2000 or so. Was it like that just in India or like everywhere else in the world? Oh, uh, I think just in India because it was, the game was more skill based and uh, you definitely need luck. I, I definitely feel that you need a certain amount of luck. Um, but I also believe that your convictions is about what carry you through. You know the like the unwavering belief that you will play for India. I remember in 2010, I was at RCB, and Virat was Kohli was a part of the side, and he had an unwavering belief at the age of 19 that he was better than Rahul Drab. Really? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, what is this guy on? You know? Because B looked at at, at that point, Rahul Drab was in the uh, you yeah. know he's done been there, done it all. you in the back end of his career, so he was a huge achiever. And Virata Sun's coming into the into the scene at that point. And 2009, I remember. Like, what is this guy on? You know? And sure enough, that unwavering belief today has made Virat Kohli, who he is, he, who stands head and shoulders above most, if not all, of the the Indian batters who have ever, who have ever played for him. Yeah. One of like I think the most disciplined. Yeah. The most you know, the well practiced, well played. Yeah. So I think that part is what is what kind of like changes you, you know, and and and, and takes you to the next level, yes. keeps you there. Yeah, because getting there is one thing, but remaining there is 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 a whole other boy game. Remaining there, I think, is all about being disciplined. How disciplined you are to sustain that, and yeah, and also about figuring out. I think it's not it's it's also not just about yeah, discipline is one big part of it. For as far as your work ethic is concerned, as far as your training is concerned, as far as your skill work is concerned and practice and all of that, recovery is concerned, uh, nutrition is concerned, that discipline is one in part. Yeah. You need to have the discipline to make sure there are there are other aspects as well when you play international cricket. There's a, you know, there's there's politics in every part of your life, right? Uh, you have to understand the politics that go with, within that, you know, and the earlier you understand it, the better. And that's why you lose the innocence of a child because you have to think very tangently you don't think straight. It's not straightforward. It's very like it's very crisscross, and that's you have to get into that. To have the discipline to stay within what works for you as well, and find your niche there as as a as a person. So I think those are things that you. For me, I didn't have anyone to teach me that. I think maybe that's why I didn't play as much as I could have played. Um, but I think those are things that are very important to know as a youngster, uh, and I think a lot of, a lot of athletes coming through the ranks now understand it. I think the onset of social media has also kind of amped that up a little yeah. bit more and they're a lot sharper today. Kids are a lot more sharper. You see them maturing very, very quickly. I see kids uh, who have matured, like the level of maturity I had at 28, they have that at 16. Really. Yeah. You yes. know, and that's phenomenal to watch, but you lose a, there's also give and take, right? With that, you take away a little bit of innocence, you take away a little bit of childishness and then there's that's the other you, you lose the passion because when you, when you are like that, Mature at that. It steals away joy. Yeah, it steals away that little joy. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you must have had it that time in your teenage when you were just playing every game by game, game by game in the selections. So, as you said, the politics, what was it like to actually get to Indian team and the journey, you know, in your teenage? And how that deal with, with all of that? I think, well, I'm, I'm sure there must be like hundreds of thousands of maybe, I don't know, Crows of guys and kids who would want to be at your place yeah. and get selected for the for the country. Well, yeah. So obviously there is, and the number of kids playing cricket today are enormous. And today, 
um, the support from parents also are a lot because yes. you can earn more than a healthy living yes. um, by pursuing cricket as a mm. as a profession, right? Um, but a lot of people, I think, get filtered out because they look at the money mm. uh, and they don't look at am I actually pursuing my passion? Yeah. You know, and if you're not pursuing your passion, it's got to be work always, exactly. right? And you don't want your profession to be work. I think you it would you'd be very wise if you could pick uh, a profession that is actually your passion and figure out a way a, to make a profession out of your own passion. Yes. You know, much like what you've done, right? It took me twelve years to make it happen. Yeah, but but you know, when you do that, it doesn't feel like work. You can open the biggest gym in the world, and it still doesn't feel like work. It feels like, man, I, I want to do this. I want to do this well. It excites you. You wake up in the morning thinking, I want to do this. I, I sleep early just because you know I want to go to gym and I want to train. Correct. Just and that's what I have always done. Uh, in my childhood, you know, like I had to start just to get to gym, and the part of deal was I would, I would clean the gym. Correct. Correct. Fill water in the gym. I would close the gym. I would open the gym so that I don't have to pay. And now imagine I'm coming one of the biggest gym, and in, in the world, the best gym in the world, and that's mine. Yeah. Coming for. Passion stays the same because that doesn't change. Correct. If I was, if I started for money, I would be looking many more areas to make more money. Correct. And wasting, not wasting that time which I'm investing right now. It would be a waste in my in my training session. Yes, absolutely. And I think a lot of people miss that, <clears throat> lose out on that. And for me, I feel like, I for me it was I, I knew I loved the gear. You know, even to this day. Whether I'm doing broadcasting, whether I'm I'm helping someone with their game, whether I'm playing the game, it is all so much fun, and I I feel extremely grateful to God uh, and to the universe that I was able to recognize that this was my passion, and I just wanted to pursue that. And I think any youngster who's listening or watching should should actually seek what that passion is and figure out to make that their profession and that their career. Because if they do that, there's nothing more joyous than that. Because you'll be living your purpose. Beautiful, beautifully said. As you said, like this is the passion. So if you describe what exactly you love about the game, that's something. That this is what I love about this. You know, for an, for me, for an example, like I love training because the outcome of this is I can see it on my body, mm. I can see it on my mind, I can see it on my skin, literally, and it's so contagious that it changes the whole surrounding. Right now, that's why we only exist here because of what I started at that yeah. So, what is that thing that you know about the about cricket that you love so much? Just can't stop playing. For me, like I said, I feel there is a beauty in bringing fifteen, twenty, thirty minds together to achieve one goal. Because you think that you win a world championship or a world cup by by just eleven guys playing out there? No, absolutely not. It takes eleven plus another eleven plus the support staff plus the administrators and taking that call. Like it has, it's a trickle down effect, right? But to bring that, and so at, at the at the end of it, who, who are the people in control? It's it's the fifteen who are playing there, it's the fifteen who are right there, right? So for me, I feel like that becomes extremely critical. So for me, that is what excites me the most to bring those fifteen people together. To achieve that one common goal, where you live for each other, where you work for each other, where you're adding value and you're and, and I'm adding value to and you are adding value back back to me, so that we achieve that goal of winning this game or winning this championship game or winning like a World Cup or or winning an IPL for that matter, right? And that's what excites me the most about that. That's amazing. Yeah. So, how was your performance before getting to Indian team? How were you playing and were you sco- scoring really high? I mean, what were you so good at that you got selected at a young age? So I played very differently. I didn't play the traditional um, mode of playing back then. It's become a norm today. You know, they play hyper aggressive cricket today, and I was doing that as a as a kid. I'd get chucked out of my uh, of the practice because I hit too many balls in the air. Really, multiple times. And and today they'd be like, "Don't hit the ball on the ground. Hit it in the air." And I would get chucked out at uh, uh, practice so many times in my academy because I hit the I hit too many balls in the air. Mm. And uh, so for me, I think that's what made me different. I scored a lot of runs. Um, there's obviously this aggression that was there that came out uh, when I batted. So I was very aggressive. I'd always take the attack to the bowlers. I always wanted to dominate the bowlers. There's a lot of joy and fun that I that I experienced by, by doing that. 
um, and that helped me win games for my team. And then that's just the high of being able to add value to an extent that you'll be able to win matches for your team, for your, uh, it could be your school team, your state team, your country, it could be under 15 India, it could be under 17 India. Just to be able to do that was, I think, very joyous. And um, that's what that's what I enjoy the most. Of. And when you got selected and then you described the first match and what was your score in the first match? At that point, I had scored. I had a, I had the record of scoring the highest score by an Indian on debut. I scored eighty six on my debut. Wow! Uh, and I got out, um, run out, the freak freak dismisses. But uh, yeah, eighty six on debut. So how was the journey being an Indian cricket team, and how did you deal with your, uh, as you said, the aggression was there? Was it like did it actually? bother you or did it bother other people also because when you have that because what I believe you have the rage rage is very important for a man to actually pursue his dream and passion and live life with full of passion so rage is important but when it start affecting other people then it's not according to others then they start calling it oh he's so aggressive it's so he's playing yeah. so aggressive because they are not liking it yeah and I'm sure I had, the corner is there. Of course, of course, he's not liking the way you're playing because you're playing aggressively. Yeah. And that's what he has a problem with. Yeah. So how did you deal with this in the team? Because there are so many people around you. There are coaches around you. There are boards around you. And the way you play, sometimes it may have done well. Sometimes it may have done, you know, the opposite also. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's happened so many times to me. I remember uh, in one under-19 state game, uh, I... I played a couple of reverse sweeps, scored a couple of boundaries, and I played a reverse sweep and I got out LBW. And because I played a reverse sweep and got out LBW, I got dropped from the main state side, the Ranji the senior state team, because I played that kind of a shot and got out. So for me, people never understood that, or people didn't perceive that I was slightly possibly ahead of the curve at that point in time. And I saw the game quite, I perceived the game quite differently. So, and I think when there's a lack of understanding, there's, there's, you know, when you don't meet someone halfway and then you're saying, okay, this is, he's not or she's not matching up where I want them to match up, even though they've got potential. I think it's it's not because, I think you're not seeing it right, you're not perceiving it right. I think you'd rather have a conversation with that person and understand where that person, and you got to be willing to meet halfway to say, you know, come, let's have a conversation. Let's sit down and say, explain to me why you did that. What drives you to do that? And then you, once you understand what drives them to do that, then you understand, okay, this is what the, this is what the crux of the matter is. How do you work around this? Because you don't want to lose, um, you know, that talent one and the the USP that that person brings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, commu- I'm big for communication. And it's a lot of things that I didn't have as a youngster. And then I found it in one of my coaches. And uh, when I played with him and he met me halfway, he got, he brought the best out of me in incredible ways. Uh, I, it brought the best out of me because I felt I was... Uh, I was met halfway. I felt like someone was keenly interested in, in working on my game. Uh, and that just worked like beautifully to my advantage. Uh, initially, when I got on the Indian team, for me, I was living my dream. You know, I was, I, I remember sitting in the dressing room and well, Robert, Robert there, there's Saul Gumri there, there's Sachin Tendulka there, there's Vingrat Singh there, there's uh, others everywhere else. And I'm just sitting down there and this, what is going on here? Yeah. So all of 20 years old, I'm looking at all of these great people who admired and, and idolized my entire childhood. And here I am, going to be playing shoulder to shoulder with them. So I was like a kid in a candy store, just looking at everyone and observing and learning as much as I could. Um, but that bubble bur- burst very fast because uh, two matches after I scored, uh, after my debut game, I got dropped from the Indian team. Mm-hmm. Because it was also a very difficult team to get into, uh, you know, in, in all fairness. What uh, pressure, right? More than pressure, it was, the competition was really high. There was Virinder Sehwag, there was Sachin Tendulkar, there was Saurabh Ganguly, there was Gautam Gambhir, uh, Rahul Dravid, and all these five people were opening the batting. Mm. And I was also an opener. And, and I'm the youngest of the lot. I got so you entered Indian cricket team just as an opener? Yeah. So first match was as an opener? As, as, as an opener. Wow. And, and I, I got into the team when Paji, Sachin Paji was injured. And this match was against? England. England, okay. Uh, when when uh, Sachin Paji was injured, I think a tennis elbow injury. And then I think Virubai was uh, in the Seva, uh, was sitting out, uh, was resting for that game. And then I got a game. So then suddenly scored runs and then suddenly I'm like in the mix. Um, but then because the competition is so high and then I had two games after that 86. 
and then I got dropped. Then I had to score a thousand runs in domestic cricket to be considered again. Thousand runs. Yeah. And how long did it take? Like the entire domestic scene. So I got Ranji Trophy. I scored eight hundred and sixty runs in Ranji Trophy, and then a few more like, uh, and then one day cricket after that in domestic, and then scored thousand, two hundred, thousand, three hundred runs, and then then I came back in the Indian setup again. Okay. Then we went and played the infamous 2007 World Cup where we lost to Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Mm. Then we got out in the first of the first round of the the World Cup, uh, and then I thought, gone, my career is over. You know, I I didn't think I'll play for India again after that because I you I'm the easy and I felt like I was the easiest one to be to get cut because I was very disposable. I just barely played any cricket. Mm. I played less than ten matches for India. No, yeah, less than twelve matches for India. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be disposed of. Mm. But no, I was kept in the side, and then I, I I was in the reserves for a long time, and then six months later we went went on to win the T Twenty World Cup in in two thousand and seven, uh, and I was able to contribute in a big way, um, in important ways in in us winning that T Twenty World Cup. T Twenty World Cup that happened in South Africa in two thousand and seven, um, and that kind of changed it. How was your performance in that? Very good. First game against Pakistan, we were twenty for four. I got a fifty. I just get to 150. We ended up tying that game and won the game through a bowl out. Um, after the which we, we beat different sides. I think we lost only one game to New Zealand, but after that every game against South Africa, against you know every other team, we beat that and we got we beat Australia in the semi-finals and then we beat uh, Pakistan again in the mines. You know, it was a phenomenal tournament. Um, you know, stuff of dreams to be honest. To be able to win a World Cup when you're 21 years old is yeah. Um, you don't fathom that stuff. You just you know, you visualize all of that growing up. Yes. And then when it, when it, when it actually happens, you're like, wow. You know, you, you've actually become a part of history. And then the IPI came about immediately the next year. And that just kind of ho- changed the whole face of cricket. Mm-hmm. And um, this is where cricket is. It's evolved. Uh, you know, you cannot beat evolution. Uh, I'm sure you, you understand that mm-hmm. given, you know, where, where you are today in your life. And... Uh, the game's evolved so much, especially in the last five years. It's just, I think it's tripled in the base of, of evolution. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, since the IPL time, uh, not just the, just the, you know, the passionate cricketers or the kids who are uh, from our country yeah. and they wanted to play, but also the sponsorships, the money is involved, uh, the business is involved. I think everything from every area, it has just grown like this to another equation. It has. Uh, it has grown a lot, yeah. Uh, but I, I would say that the main stakeholders of the of the game, uh, for them, it hasn't grown. It's grown exponentially for them also, but not as much as it has grown for the game itself. Mm. Um, I would say for other stakeholders like broadcasters, um, administrators, yeah. uh, associations, or boards, has been a lot of growth. It's, it's exponential growth of money that that you know some boards have never ever experienced. But I'd say, even say from the IPL, the main stakeholders are the players. Mm. The players get on a total of 100 crores uh, per team, mm. right? 90 crores per team. Um, whereas the IPL makes about about five and a half thousand crores per year. Um, so you can see the discrepancy there. There, should, there. there has to be. I think that's the only place where there's room for improvement. Mm. Yeah, um, but the game has gotten so good. But but what about the, uh, you know, why I was growing up and I used to watch uh, cricket. I have seen religiously cricket, I think up to um, 13, 14, when I just started training. Okay. And when I got really... You started at 13, 14? So I started training at the age of 12, 12 and a half. Okay. So I started doing push-ups and pull-ups and all of that when I was young. Right. Um, but when I reached 13, so I just joined the gym, as I said, like to... I was cleaning the gym and all that. This yeah, yeah, started, yeah, right. And when I got so passionately about into training, and I, again, the same like you, like yeah. I wanted to compete and I want to travel the world. I wanted to be a fitness model and I wanted to be on the cover page of magazines. So all those dreams, and I started visualizing and it started manifesting. I started cutting all the pictures of Honor Schwarzenegger and everyone on my wall, putting all these uh, cover pages on my wall, and I started just manifesting like this is what I'm going to do. That time I did not know how to speak English and I didn't know how to read English. I've never been to a school at that time. Uh, I was not educated. So that time, the business, what I know today, I started in those days. So I started selling milk so that I can 
save at least half a liter or one liter of milk so that I can have protein. I can provide protein to my muscles. I started working at a book stall so that I can learn to read English mm. and I can go through all these magazines and learn and just explore and increase my knowledge. And then I was cleaning the gym so that I can go and train. So all these, every area, whatever I was doing, I was doing for a reason. So if I give this, what do I get in return? And no one taught me that this is, I just thought like this is the only way I can get because I don't know, I didn't have money. Yep. I didn't have support. I didn't have any backup. I didn't have any uh, recommendations that took okay, I can go and do whatever I want. I had to survive and I had to just pursue my dream. And at that time, so when I was, when I got so busy, I, I never got a chance to actually sit and watch one full match. Yeah. Not just a match on maybe the movies also. Maybe yeah. many, many things which yeah. I missed out in my Yeah, and I think that that's that's part that's part for the part for the course, right? I think you you kind of acknowledge that when I'm pursuing my passion, I'm gonna have to make a lot of sacrifice and then don't feel like sacrifices. It just feels like yeah, it's not it's not important for me. Yeah. People say, Oh, you don't have a limit, but like I want to I want to pursue my dream only. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And and, and I think that you know, I think it depends on where you are also in your life. I think there's a certain age. I think, uh, you know, I think for sports people, um, for athletes, what they what they kind of mentioned is between the ages of 20, 18 and, and 27, 28, make sure you practice as much as you can. Like, just abuse your body. I mean, to the extent of over-practicing evil. Because that will only serve you at the back end of 28 and 29. You know, you... You get into your early thirties and suddenly you see all the effort you've put there, you shift and then it, it becomes it becomes a foundation on which you build everything else in your in your career. And uh, you know, I, and you you'll actually notice this in a lot of Indian cricketers if 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 you're still keen about you. Know, a lot of cricketers go through injuries between the age of thirty one and thirty four because they keep practicing the way they practice between the ages eighteen and twenty eight, and they feel like that's how you practice, that's how I prepare, and that's how I do it. Then, but then they don't realize that the body has changed. Because yeah. after 30, the body changes. Yeah. And you, your body doesn't recover the same way it does or did before uh, the 30, 29, 30. For me, it, it, for me, it was 32. I think it varies between people. Some, for some people, it's 30. Some people, it's, it's 32, yeah. 33. But, and so it's, it's, it varies. And then you see a lot of readers going through like, just freak injuries sometimes. And I think it becomes very, very important for them to be aware about when that body shift happens and to understand your body. So I think at a young age, you really want to practice as, as much as possible. You want the repetitions, the 10,000 hours as they call it. Yeah. You want to have as much of that. After that, you're just about understanding and awareness of your own body and where you are and then how you get the best out of yourself with what you have. Exactly. That's what I always tell with everyone that when you're in your 20s, I mean, when I was in my 20s, I was in my teens and 20s, both these two decades, I pushed just for one thing that how much can I, you leave me in the gym? Oh, you will, until, unless it's time to close, I will not stop. And, but when I'm in my 30s, I'm all about recovery. Correct. We, we discuss, yeah. we discuss like about yeah. the sleep, we discuss yeah. about ice bath, we discuss about how are you recovering? I mean, like yeah. when, whenever I am there and talking to anyone who is in 30s, I only say one thing. And if you, first of all, of course, you need to be passionate about whatever the game you play or yeah. training and fitness. After that is recovery yeah absolutely and i know when you because in the 20s you don't realize that uh, when if you put so much efforts and recovery you feel like it's a waste of time why am i doing it why am i sleeping so long yeah why am i sitting in the sauna or ice bath or going for a massage you know it's like uh, uh and i think especially what my mindset is where i have come from you know so if i am paying let's say indian rupees let's say 200 rupees for a massage mm. those days maybe yeah. rupees or 800 rupees if I was paying for a massage, I said like, and this much money I can eat yeah. a little more. Yeah. You know? So that is also recovery. I will recover. Why do I need to do this? Or why do I need to go to a physio? Why do I need to do this? But all of that, I paid At the price. Bed. Like yeah. I have gone through a shoulder surgery. Yeah. Just like uh, one and a half year ago. Yeah. The other shoulder was injured as well. Both these injured. Back is injured. But now how I train and or, alhamdulillah, like I'm in a great shape right now which is touch wood like it's uh, one of my finest shape but not just the body but the mentally and the way I'm recovering yeah the finest the, the best ever yeah so in this some interesting things now like in your in your career you have played with like um, you yourself as a legend and you have played with legends who did you enjoy playing with the most for me 
I actually enjoy playing with everyone here. Yeah. You obviously are, yeah, there are your idols that you watch growing up, right? And uh, for me, batting with Rock, like Sachin Dindulko, um, batting with Rahul Dravid, Kibran Singh, Birender Seva, Gautam Mbir. These are guys that you you grow up and then you play with them and you realize, oh man, I, w- I want to play a lot more with them. I really enjoyed playing with MS. I really enjoyed playing with Gauti. Um, I enjoyed playing with Virat as well. And he was a different person then. I mean, that transition happened in, in Chico where he just became a completely different animal altogether. And you saw that his focus was steadfast. Um, you saw that his his application of his skills were very precise. And the conviction, I think, his belief in himself and what he thinks and what he um, cons- what he believes he can achieve is incredible. Um, and I think that his fitness and his focus on his on his disciplines uh, is what helps him achieve um, and believe that he can achieve so much. Um, for me, that's what's been stand out as far as uh, Virat is concerned. Um, I've really enjoyed playing uh, with Rohit Sharma as well. Rohit has been um, a truly grif- gifted kind of cricketer. Uh, a lot of my mates, R.P. Singh, Piyush Chavla, M.S., Irfan Pathan, Yusuf Pathan, uh, some of my closest buddies in the game. Um, you know, you, you develop relationships and bonds along the way um, during the course of your career and, and some, some of them last a lifetime. And, you, and, I'm, and I've been very fortunate that I've been able to play with a very special bunch of Indian cricketers that have come through the ranks. Um, and I've absolutely enjoyed playing with them. And some of the youngsters also are great. Yeah, I've played with KL Rahul, Suri Kumar Yadav. Um, Surya's journey is, is, is fascinating in itself. Um, and and it's been great. I've played with, with some really fantastic cricketers domestically and internationally. Um, I've enjoyed playing uh, against Matthew Hayden, uh, yeah. one of my favorite cricketers growing up. Uh, I've played a couple of matches against Brian Lara, which is a dream of mine, you know, incredible. Um, Ricky Ponting, mm. you know, I met Ricky Ponting as a, as a young 13-year-old and he saw me back and he said, oh man, you're very talented. And he came for some, some event in Bangalore and, and he saw me back and he said, you've got great ability and, you know, you maybe you'll play for India someday. And sure enough, when we beat Australia in the semi-finals of the World Cup, he was, he was actually there, capital of the Australian side. Um, so, you know, life comes a full circle uh, quite a few times in that sense. Uh, and and it's 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 been f- fantastic, and I've been I consider myself extremely um, lucky uh, to be to have able to experience all of that and to have those life experiences. Um, yeah, uh, but some of my closest friends in the game have been obviously Indians: MS Suresh Raina, um, RP Singh, Yuvraj Shabla, Irfan Pathan. Irfan, very very dear friend. Gautam Gambhir. Um, you know, our, uh, we we back together so much, and um, he's someone that you know we we kind of get each other to that. Um, right, he said like what goes around comes around, right? Yeah. And uh, now when it comes to since you have played in the it's a team game, right? It's like uh, 11, 15 people or maybe more with other people got involved when it comes to the coaches and all. Um, they like strategize and plan, practice, put in order everyone. Uh, who's because I am really curious to know this that whose leadership that you actually admire and we learned from that and maybe you have implemented the same in your own life and, and it can be personal or professional whose the leadership quality is like you know beyond just the cricket because mm-hmm. that's what is more important because that's what I do yeah my clients and my team as well here the, the lessons I teach and the lessons I have learned from many people in my life as well that it, it should be beyond than just what is what you see. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I think for me, I think three people who have kind of played leadership, so who I've looked up to as leaders and really enjoyed playing under that has been uh, Anil Kumbhya. Uh, uh, this phenomenal human being with great work ethic um, and a, a leader who kind of tries to simplify stuff. Um, Anil Kumbhya. Uh, but I agree under him uh, in Karnataka, uh, on my state side, where he was a captain. Um, I really enjoyed playing under Gautam and Gautam Gambhir and uh, MS Dhoni. Um, very simple uh, concepts. Um, they work from a place where uh, they understand that people at this level are performers. 
And to be at this level, you just need to create the atmosphere that they are able to bring the best out of themselves. So what they do is they provide security. Because if a human being is working from a place where he's feeling secure, his focus is always going to be on performances. If a person doesn't have security, he's working from a place of survival, yeah. his focus is always going to be on survival. Um, and these three leaders, I think what they did is they provided security. Um, they provided an, an atmosphere where they backed the player so much that they made the player focus on performance rather than survival. Okay. And for me, uh, Gauti and uh, MS have done that the best. So I think that's where you would bring the best out of them. Right? Yeah. That's, these are the qualities. Anything which you uh, you would like to share, let's select these, one of these uh, mentors or the leaders they have said to you and spoken to and explain to you something and that actually has changed your game you know it's you know it's not as much as they say it's actually what they do yeah. um you know funnily enough with both Gauti and uh money uh they don't say much they speak when you're when they are spoken to um they have enough information to give you they just give you bits of information from time to time um, you can ask them something and they'll be like, yeah, it's fine. They're always open to having a conversation with you. They're not closed off. And they treat everyone the same. The vice captain, the head coach, and the youngest player in the team all get treated the same. There's no difference in the way uh, anyone is treated. And for me, it's about what they do more than what they say. And what they do is create an atmosphere where it's relaxed. Mm. Your responsibilities are your own. You have to take the onus of fulfilling your responsibilities. No one's going to keep telling you to do your work. Yeah. Like uh, in the last team that I played for in the IP at CSK, not a single practice session that was a compulsory practice session. Every practice session is optional. Mm. Everyone. So we do it if you want to do it. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. It's your pity. And suddenly you're like, okay, I'm not going to practice today. You tell him, okay, tomorrow do I have to go for practice? I'm like, I haven't gone yesterday. I better go today. Yeah. You know, the bonus is on yourself. And then as a youngster, say you're someone who's relaxed and you're very confident in your game and even if you feel like, okay, you know what, I've gone for practice for three days or four days in a row. Um, and then like, okay, I'll take the next three days off. And then you take three days off Everyone's noticing, everyone knows it, everyone knows, okay, you haven't done about that. They won't say anything here. Mm. You don't go. And then you make it four days, we're like, okay, I've gotten my break, I'm going to go back. You know, and then the once the onus and the responsibility of your own, of your own figure is on you, and your own career is on you, you suddenly take the ownership. And, like, okay. and then it's not like the franchise or the captain will, will not notice what you're doing. They notice what you're doing, how much you're putting in, how much of a team man you are or a team person you are and then if you're adding value to the team or not and if you're not yeah. and if you're not like turning off a practice and you're not showing that attitude of commitment towards the team and its purpose you won't be picked the next team. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it's, it's and, and there's no love loss. They'll respect you the same, they'll love you the same, they'll speak to you the same but you don't serve our team anymore. So, you know, we'll move on. We'll try to find someone else. And that's why I think for you, because you're playing with the Aliyah, because you set a standard. Yes. The standards have already been set. And you're willing to meet people halfway. And I think great leaders meet people where they are and help them elevate themselves. Yes. I think poor leaders <laughs> expect players to meet them where they're at. Mm. But great leaders always meet people exactly where they are and they, they, more often than not, they pick good people, mm. meet them where they are, help them elevate by themselves. They don't handhold them necessarily. You know, and, I, and, and that's what I've seen with great leaders. And Gauti and, and MS are two such leaders. Exactly. I think that's, they won't take credit also. That's the most important thing. Tale. And you have played cricket uh, with Indian team at the peak. Like, this is like a most uh, demanding cricket, I think. Yeah. You have played at that time. Am, am I correct? Yeah, I'd say it was the most crowded as far as skills are concerned, yeah. as far as talent is concerned. Uh, competition was like competition more. was extremely high, uh, and it got really high very very quickly. And that's why it's also I think uh, I would I would say that you need to understand not just your own game, your skills, your your disciplines, but you also have to understand 
what it takes to not just get there but remain there because there's another game that's also played you know you need to understand the how to kind of yeah one is like your skills and you play and the other thing is like you need to use your brain brain how to be there yeah. at because at the end of the day you you only you're only serving yourself yes. you know uh, and and if you're able to remain there you will be able to re- serve the country yes. but if you're not able to remain there then you're not able to serve the country or your team you know definitely some of the crazy work ethics that you have seen and yours also and the other people like if you say uh, let's say ms actually he did this like which is crazy which no one else does or the virat does this which is not like anyone else because i'm sure they must be having some yeah for sure i mean so for me uh, i would like i think till i broke down at 32 i had tendonitis in my right hamstring left hamstring when i did this and this when i realized okay i need to do something different and then i recovered which is a long drawn process and after that i shifted the way until then i was a volume man mm. so i would do like volume and volume and volume and practice so like i'd love to hit a thousand balls a session i'd love to hit 500 balls a session um i'd love to hit 3000 balls a week and say okay i want to hit 3000 balls a week but one of the craziest people i've drawn a lot of inspiration from is rahul dravid i remember we were playing the 2010 um uh, ipl in thing for rcb and rahul bhai started practice at the 10 in the morning he started in the indoors batted for a couple of hours and then so we also batted in the indoors for about a couple of hours and then we broke for lunch uh and then we had a second session at 4 o'clock which is a fielding session uh and then i just finished lunch and i come back to pick up some stuff i saw rahul dravid batting outside in the nets and and that was at about 12:30 12:45 uh and then i said okay he's still maybe he wants to bat a little bit more and then i came back at 4 o'clock he was still batting at 4 o'clock mm-hmm. and this was at the age of 37 37 30 36 37 so like when he's well on is not like early on in his career and he was obsessed with bat and about getting it right i've not seen a man with like him on a complete work ethic on point all the time throughout their career throughout their career like i've drawn so much of inspiration from the likes of anil kumble jawagal shrinath rahul dravid venkatesh prasad sunil joshi who's all of them who from my state and all of them had incredible work ethic so for me I'm like okay i have to if like if i even if i don't set my own standard i have to meet this standard every day of my life you know and along with everything that i was going through as far as uh you know because of my 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 period with steroids um uh, it had a massive impact on how i metabolized stuff so it's my em- slowed down but i also had a lot of issues at home which made me go to food uh and and sweets and food and and junk as solas in the sunlensi indulging yeah so I indulged a lot in that so it wasn't serving me then i so constantly throughout my career i fluctuated with weight i got in really lean then put on a lot of weight again really lean. so if i if i take a break from the game um especially this happened especially after 32 33 every time i took a break i'd come back say i took a break for a couple of weeks to come back 6 7 kilos heavy oh I had to lose that again. Mm-hmm. So it's always working from behind the eight ball, um, and then working back to you know top prime fitness, which will take time again. Because you, I used to put on very easily, uh, and I had to constantly be on a diet. And emotionally very tiring, uh, physically very taxing. Uh, you you couldn't switch off. Even when you switched off, it's like there and there's guilt involved. There's a lot of emotions involved. Uh, and so for me it became quite challenging after a point time like okay i need to figure out a fix yeah. to this you know and i don't think i've cracked it yet i feel like i know mentally what i need to do but it's like an ongoing process and i need to figure it out hopefully in this process yeah. what we are doing here yeah. i hope we will we'll be able to do that by the way so uh, it's really i mean like you know i am until i was watching cricket i was a big fan of just the cricket and the how it was because you know in india in the our country is been i think the the game of from the heaven yeah it call it yeah one of the most elite the best of the best and the players like you and everyone we have discussed in this in this chat i think uh, it's amazing to discuss on that now when you are here in dubai um what's the plan and how's life and what you're going to do now I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm still playing a lot of leagues around the world. I've retired from playing cricket in India, 
uh, but I've made myself available to play a lot of different leagues around the world. Mm. So uh, because I still love the game, I'm still enjoying it uh, to the to as much as I enjoyed it uh, as a kid. Um, there was a period in my life between 21 and 20, 20, 20, 20 21 and 25 that I went through some uh, mental health issues. Uh, so I felt like I lost those years with cricket. So uh, the passion to play cricket uh, is, is still massive for me. I still feel like a 15 year old who wants to play the game. Uh, but I'm again also very cognizant, very aware of where my body's at. So I have to be very careful with how much I practice and how much I push myself. Uh, as far as practice is concerned, but I'm playing a lot of cricket outside. So I'm playing some T10 leagues outside. I'm playing the IIT 20 here in Dubai. Um, hopefully playing other leagues in the world. There's different leagues happening. There's uh, a league in England. There's a league in Canada. There's a league in America. There's a league in Sri Lanka. There's a league in Bangladesh. There's a, there's a league coming up in Saudi Arabia some, oh. sometime in the future. There's some different legends leagues happening. So a lot of opportunities to play cricket. And I want to pick as much cricket as possible. One of the reasons I retired in India is because I was waiting for 10 months to just play the IPL and waiting for those 10 months, waiting those 10 months to play uh, 14 games, uh, which after a point was not even 14 games, could only be about 7 or 8 games, felt like I was, yeah, I, w I was getting frustrated because I wanted to play the game and I couldn't play the game. I wanted to play competitive cricket, but I couldn't play because I had to just wait to play the IPL. So I was like, okay, you know, and then for the family as well, I have young kids and I feel like great place really safe from, from traveling around the world playing ticket I want them to be uh, safe as well so we said okay let's try this because you can only try when the kids are young yeah, right exactly uh, I have a 5 year old I have an 11 month old so we felt like okay let's try it see how it goes for a couple of years if it's good stay so yeah, and cricket is like global and it's everywhere I think it's very global we have teams here in uh, in Dubai also yeah. uh, T10 uh, yeah. in Abu Dhabi and uh, it's, it's like the way Indian community and I mean every because it's not just about Indian community now People are subcontinent. Yeah, and it's subcontinental, and it's like uh, it's people are coming from Australia here. There, everyone is like, yeah. and every every team since the T uh, Twenty started and the IPL started. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> this is like a couple of years. I think you are quite busy playing cricket more yeah. and more. Um, and what what would you like to do with the with the Indian cricket team and the in the board? Um, if you would like to coach in the future, or you'd like to be advise something or say somehow how would you like to engage in this well i haven't thought with thought that far and uh, certainly consider coaching but I'd, I'd say that that the investment of time uh, compared to the returns the returns are very different um because as a coach you need to invest yourself so much more than a player uh and then one is you never get as speed as, as much as the players <laughs> <laughs> you know you you um and which is which is fair Having said that, I have young kids, so for me, I want to be able to be the, be a big part of their lives because they they always say that uh, the first seven eight years are the most formative years, and that sets them up for life. So for me, to be a part of their lives uh, in, in 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 a big way is something that I want to do. Uh, having said that, down the line, once they're uh, you know adolescents, uh, you definitely sure that I would consider something. Uh, I love adding value. I think uh, my human purpose in life is to add value to people around. Mm. So for me, I would uh, love to add value to people around me. And, and I do that. Um, I try and help um, a lot of uh, my co colleagues with, you know, say batting. Uh, I'm truly passionate about the batting aspect of cricket. And I think I understand the techniques of it really, really well in a deep manner. And for me, that's something I'd love to share, add value uh, wherever I am. Um, broadcasting is something that I enjoy at the moment. I'm doing it. I love it. It's fun. It's good. Um, and uh, playing right now, yeah. As in, like, I'm not able to think of things beyond that. But down the line, coaching eight, 10, 15 years from now, yeah, why not? Yeah, you, why not? And so, since you have, uh, you're a fitness freak, you have played, you're a sports legend, cricket legend, you have trained in almost everywhere in the world. Now you're here in TYB, you're working out uh, in here, a part of Kaizen. So, what is the difference between uh, working with me over here in TYB or Anywhere in the world, I've been very blessed to be honest. Uh, I said that I've met a lot of wonderful people along the way, uh, as far as my fitness journey is concerned. Um, I was working with a friend of mine who became a very close friend of mine for over the last three years in India. Mm -hmm. uh, Saurabh, uh, Saurabh runs this uh, company called Sofit, and, and uh, I was working with him for, a, for for the last three years. I really enjoyed working with him. And then since I've been here, uh, I think I've 
understood uh, fitness from a very different perspective. Um, and for me, I think that's something that I want to venture into. It's got me excited about training. It's got me excited where I'm like thinking about, okay, I really want to start my day with this, you know, and then go through the rest of my day. Um, and I feel like I'm a bit, I'm only, uh, what, 15 sessions in at the moment. Uh, very nascent stage of this journey. But I have to say that every day of this journey has been exciting, uh, challenging, has pushed me. Um, and every day I, I turn up and you you made me train with, 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 this, with this person who, who challenges me every single day. And as much as I hate it in the moment, when I finish the session, I feel so satisfied. Uh, I feel like, okay, I've, that's not tick in the box. And it's something that makes me feel good. Um, and for me, I think that's what you want to do. You really want to challenge yourself through the session. I generally like knowing what's going on or what's going to happen during my session. But I come here not knowing what's going to happen. It's completely beyond my control. It's completely out of my comfort zone. And I recognize that as a person, as a human being, that growth only happens outside the comfort zone. So I'm like, you know what? It's tough, but I get used to it. And I think that's what so far... TIB has taught, TIB has taught me where I'm like, okay, I'm out, I'm going to be outside the comfort zone. But I'm learn, enjoy, learn to enjoy being outside of my comfort zone. And I'm grateful to you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think this, that's why the whole Kaizen ideology is there, right? No, the program is based on this, which you're getting into slowly, slowly, since you have a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really push you in, yeah. in Kaizen and you play uh, one particular uh, sport yeah. uh, so well already. So, you know, I, and to have your scheduled, and along with that, how I have combined the Kaizen program with this, because we have to work as per your schedule. Correct. We cannot go, okay, this is not, this is secondary. This is, this is important to, uh, to make you better in yeah. what you do as, yeah. as main. And that is what your main is. So I want to help you. And you're looking amazing, by the way. And I expect this question. I would <laughs> I, I, I say, let's give us 30 sessions and then we'll see where it goes. Because I'm really enjoying where I'm at. As in, uh, I feel like, um, I'm recovering well. Suddenly, my focus is on, and and the kind of things that you have at the gym is is really motivating. I feel like, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of quotes that are there. Like, if you look, look, you know, go, I go through a session and I, okay, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, no, eight, nine. I have that one thing that I'm not ticking off. Yeah. What do I do to tick that off? And I go back home and I'm constantly thinking that one thing I haven't ticked off. Like for me, it's like okay, safe. I was telling you yesterday. Recovery, I like I've got big gain, push, you know, recovery is thin. And, and recovery is a white thing. Like, I need to take that off, and I'm constantly thinking in my head, okay, what do I need to do to take that off, and how do I streamline my mind? I think one of the things that has blown me over the in our interactions over the last few a month or so of weeks that have, that have been here is that one conversation where you said to me, We are creatures of roti, and he's you said to me that. If the sun and the moon have a routine and there is a time for them to rise and there is a time for them to set, who are we to not, not have routines? Because we are minuscule pieces of the same I energy. Flash. I mean, as compared to sun and moon, we can't even compare yeah. ourselves. And I'm like, that kind of smacked me in the face. I'm like, that's it. I'm like, and, and that's something I think that I will actually take to my grave. And there's certain interactions. I, I love human interaction. I love talking to people. And, and there's certain things that 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 stay with me for life. I think that's something that'll stay with me for life. Thank you, man. By just by saying that, you added more value to actually my wisdom and what I share with people. That I know that you know is going to change someone's life and it's going to inspire someone because, as you know, that um, you have you have gone through a lot of uh, I would say challenges in your life, uh, not just physically but emotionally also. Mm -hmm. And I think your words hold a lot of power. That when you because this is your bridge, it connects from this to to the other person from yeah. me to you and what I say and how you perceive it and how you are going to implement it on you in your life it's, it's going to impact your life big time and then through you it will be your kids if you can what I just said about sun and moon if you can implement it on you and your your kids will learn from you and their life will be better and mm. so I see you know what is beyond when I'm gone yeah whatever I say it, I don't speak anything which is just good in this moment or I will be I get so many likes and views and people yeah. love me because I said something like this today. But later on, <clears throat> they will they will hate me or they will say like, oh, he said it and I spoiled my life. I say anything and everything which holds more and more value. The more you use it, the better it becomes. Yeah. 
So I think yeah. that's that's why, as I said, like that's why I give the example of something which is so powerful. Yeah. Sun and moon. I mean, yeah. What are you talking about, man? Why you don't want to just be in the routine and yeah, be disciplined? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think I think that that's that's really true for anyone pursuing anything and they want to pursue in life. That that sense of discipline. It's funny, isn't it? That today the most successful things or, or things that bring them like are the most viral things in today's lingo are the things that are the most simplistic things in the world, right? Uh, if you go back and you listen to everything that's going viral about how to become successful, it's not something that we didn't know 20 years ago. Yeah. It's just that we exercise that without being without it being having to be said. But today, it has to be thrown so much light on because it's been in the darkness for the last 20 years. Just for an example, like we did not have, I mean, uh, in my in my home, we did not have the heater or, uh, uh, you know, which where you boil water and you mm. shower. So we used to just take bath with the cold water. Cold, yeah. And now you see that, I mean, we used to be like, oh my God, we are so poor that we can't even afford to have a hot water, a hot, uh, hot bath. And today, it's, it's this is your routine. That first thing you wake up, take cold, cold shower, cold take cold bath. I think it's just it's amazing. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't and it? Everything is like that. Yeah. Anyway, it's a beautiful conversation, man. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.